Okay, welcome to the Saturday morning edition of the Sumer Sports Show. We ran a little long there on the intro song. It's early for all of us. Ben has made it back from his fatherly duties of being uh, a, a, a hockey dad, right? Hockey. What else? Hockey what else life. Are you working on with? I mean, that was it. We live, we are, you know, fully embracing the Minnesota background that we have, basically 100% hockey. It seems like all the time I know other people have moved on to spring sports, but we are, uh, you know, kind of in the thick of it, I guess, still. So Saturday morning, early ice session with the youngest two, and now we're we're back just in time for the San Antonio, our Brahmas, basically, uh, kicking off here in a half an hour where we've already seen some line movements. So I'm like locked and loaded now. I have no other responsibilities. Uh, my 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 oldest son might try and get me to play some pickleball later, depending on the weather and, and and the wind and those sorts of things. But other than that, I'm watching UFL football. Maybe a little, maybe a little Final Four. I don't know. So uh, it's been good though. We'll see. What do you got planned for today? Uh, I am going to let's see. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna get off this this broadcast. I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna. I actually, uh, people forget this. Uh, I am an academic, so I have to uh, referee papers. So I got a paper published with Tej in the journals of quantitative analysis and sports. So now I've been reviewing papers for them. Uh, that's kind of how it works, I guess. So I have about ten pages to read. I'm gonna read that during the first quarter of our Brahmas, right? If people looked at the Sumer Sports UFL preview last week, we were high on the Brahmas relative to the market. They kicked Ash last week. Now they're two-point road favorites, favorites. Yep. this week. Uh, and I, I, we may, and look, it's it's vibes right now. We have a model that uses a little bit of the PFF grades. They use a little bit of the uh, my preseason priors. Use a little bit of coaching. You know, people forget that Wade Phillips was a NFL coach. Uh, AJ right. Smith is like not only a, a pretty good offensive mind, but like a really good like he has, he has a VR company, he has a a film watching company, a really good offensive mind. Uh, I make the game four and a half. It's a two point game. So for anybody in the comment section, uh, you know, this is a game that you know, our, our friend Diggs uh, probably. Uh, you know, who's phenomenally sharp, uh, somebody I look up to quite a bit. Uh, it says the, the biggest joke on this show is I, I, I say we're not going to talk about gambling, and then we talk about gambling the whole the time. The entire time. We just yeah. led into it at that point, it's right? Like the biggest so. bit ever, but, uh, but that's, that's the one. We'll, we'll talk about the whole slate here in a second. I do want to talk to you briefly about two NFL uh, moves here because, firstly – while I was at the Atlanta Hawks facility on Wednesday, they broke the news to me, interestingly. Uh, Savon Diggs was traded from the Buffalo Bills to the Houston Texans. The Bills actually take on $3 more million in uh, 2024 cap hit to take on a second-round pick next year. The, the Houston Texans, of course, get Diggs. Uh, they get him at a, like a pretty big discount, and this is why, right. folks, when you think about you know these contracts and you think about guarantees and how they're structured, you know you do have to you do have to worry. So like the, the cap number for Diggs this year is five point eight million, and then he's got four more void years. If they were to only play Diggs this year and then void out the whole deal, he would be worth sixteen point six dead to the cap next year. Obviously, if they if if they like him and they sign him to an extension, those sixteen point six million then can get spread out through the duration of the next contract. That's how voids work. That's the benefit from the team side for voids. The benefit from the player side for voids is that Diggs can get basically uh, – Diggs can get get out of Houston in one year. Also, right. not going to count as a comp pick. And, and I think you know my comp pick article came out Monday. It was really well received. Uh, but the one, the one thing that Over the Cap really did a good job with in their comp picks article years ago – which I think was was really shown to be true here on Wednesday was you don't you're not qualified for the comp pick formula if a player or sorry you only are are qualified you only qualify for the comp pick formula if uh, if the if the player leaves without your control in this case Houston changed the contract so that he could leave after a year <coughs> so he's not qualified to be a comp pick player. We have <laughs> ZT in the uh, in the comments. 
with some interesting comments. Sumer Sports should build a physics engine. Look, we're just trying to I'll build tell to that, yeah. for NFL teams right now. Uh, we'll, we'll get there, ZT. Uh, firstly, as a Minnesota Vikings fan, Ben, do you feel vindicated at all that Stephon Diggs wore out his welcome in another place? Or was his time in Buffalo a success? Obviously, Justin Jefferson has been great in Minnesota as well. The first round pick they got back. Um, what are your thoughts when you see Diggs moving on to Houston for both sides? Yeah, I didn't know if it was like a completely like sour grapes type take from me and, and feeling like the Vikings very much look like they kind of came out ahead in this whole ordeal, basically. Obviously, we don't want to judge the situation this far after the fact from the Vikings perspective, but it does at least seem to me like there was some... I like I, I get why the Bills moved on from him for a second round pick, and I actually think that's relatively good compensation. Kind of like you said, they are eating a little bit of his twenty twenty four salary, but to me, like there still had to be some underlying issues brewing beneath the surface in order for the Bills to do this trade. I would say right now, and I think that's maybe the. The, the the thing that, like, you know, as a Vikings fan, you have to feel better about getting the first round draft pick. I do think, you know, post Tyreek Hill and Devontae Adams trade and, and the compensation that they got, in some ways, it does seem like the veteran receiver market has at least taken a little bit of a step back and what and what and what guys are going to get from a from a trade compensation standpoint. Obviously, that's very much driven by the contract situation. But the fact that like the Bills did get a second round pick for Stefan Diggs in what could very effectively be like a, a a one year rental sort of thing, I think in some ways has to be a win, but very much like kind of closes the championship window in which they have unless they do a ton of maneuvering around the Josh Allen contract situation. So to me, I think I feel in a lot of ways, you know, vindicated from a Viking standpoint, I feel bad in a lot of ways for Bills fans because of the situation that arose, but I also think it's weird. Because we going back to it, like the Josh Allen and his early year career arc made it really difficult for the Bills to kind of build and maximize his championship window on that rookie deal because it took so long for them to figure out really what they had with Josh Allen that they never really got to experience some of like the Joe Burrow impact and, and what we're seeing with CJ Stroud now. And in some ways they had, you know, a little bit of a band-aid fix getting Stefan Diggs, but it very much did not work out for them. And I think longer term, like the direction of that franchise seems very much, I would say, in peril right now. Well, yeah, let's let's expound upon that because I think you you bring up a good point. By the way, one of our favorites, very difficult, could you know, may or may not have been mentioned earlier uh, in the in the chat. Uh, Beat gamer has is the quality of this year's wide, draftable wide receivers decreased trade prices possibly. Um, I think it's not like it's been this way for a long time. You are trading for the contract of the player of which Diggs is, is a lot. Um, and yet Buffalo is eating a significant amount of it too. So I, I just think Diggs, you talk about 13 consecutive games, a hundred yard game last year. He was very tepid at the end of the year. Um, uh, I, I think football has a pretty good, uh, a pretty good uh, beat here. Um, you know, for elite wide receivers like Diggs is age related decline slower. Is it still steep? Very difficult, by the way. Is this showboat steam coming in right now? Are we going to get negative? Like, oh no, uh, negative. Rama's opinion is going to get negative. <laughs> is going to get negative plead right now. Negative plead in the US so. Who knows? Is it worth anything? Uh, good question here. We'll, we'll get Diggs to that is right moving now. markets against us right now. But, is what it but, but like to, me. to your point, but to your point, Ben. Let me present for. Let me present r really quick. Um, one thing. Uh, one thing here on the Josh Allen deal, and this is from our friends at Over the Cap. Um, this is his, this is his contract. This isn't unlike a lot of veteran court contracts, Ben, but it does, it, it does speak to, I think one of the things that you talked about, which, you know, Allen in 18 as a rookie was not particularly great. 19, that Bill's team was good at 10 and six bowed out in the early, early part of the playoffs. Um, you know, but as a passer, not the best. So, you know, but at least gave the Bills enough of a license to go out and get digs. 2020, they're all, the you know, that was, that the, year. Yeah, that was that the year. year. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was the, the breakout, year, right? Yeah. And then, then he gets an extension, and, you know, after that year. But notice this ramp up period. You're, you're now, you know, and, and, and a lot of the, you do get like, a lot of this is a, a, is a, a, a product of the renegotiation, you know, restructuring and everything. And so a lot of these cap numbers 
that you're seeing here are a reflection of the fact that they've pushed money into the future to bring in Von Miller and everything. But the the to your point, when you look at Houston in contrast to Buffalo, Houston has said full speed ahead now year two of CJ right. Stroud, and they're getting to do all of the things. Um, you know, the Danell Hunter, the Aziz El Shire, the, the backing into Dalton Schultz again, all of those things. In year two, which means that when the bill comes due, you're going to be earlier into C.J. Stroud's second contract, which right. means it's just going to be a little less spendy than it was for Buffalo when you're year 24 with 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 uh, Josh Allen. You know, you're, there's not a lot you can pack into these last few years because you've already done a decent amount of that by the structure of the deal, by virtue of the fact that he was a little bit later to rise up. And that's, you know, whereas with, with I this at all for Houston, right? Because you're year two and it's sort of like when Kansas City, it's actually a little bit different. Kansas City had one year sitting Mahomes, but they knew right away from watching him on the bench that he was great. They went with Sammy Watkins at an overpay right away in year two of Mahomes. Then in year three, they went out and got Frank Clark. Like they kind of started early because they knew Mahomes was good right away. Because Allen took one more year than, for example, C.J. Stroud did, it is good. It was harder to sort of break up with the idea of winning on a with the quarterback on a rookie window than it will be for Houston, possibly. So it, it's it's a very interesting one. The last one I want to talk about before we get into some of the markets here, before we close out the show uh, and, and go watch some UFL football, uh, Derek Brown, he gets about a twenty-five million dollar per year deal from uh, Carolina. When I first wrote it up in 2020, I was like, Derek Brown probably doesn't offer enough as a pass rusher to be worth a top 10 pick. Um, I will say this, Carolina has not been a successful franchise since drafting right. him at eight. Like there was uh, opportunity cost there, but Derek Brown has turned out to be a hell of a player. Uh, just eight sacks in his career, uh, or per the PFF numbers, I can't remember what the official NFL numbers are. Um, but he's certainly been productive. He he both a you know uh, almost a ten percent run stop rate, uh, more than a seven and a half pressure rate, uh, which is pretty good um, for an interior for a nose tackle. Uh, this is this is a an expensive time to need an interior defensive lineman in the time of the two high shells and needing to two gap uh, at the NFL level. Um, you know Carolina has spent a lot of money now on two guards and a defensive tackle. Uh, and then they went out and got Josie Jewell as well. Like, they're truly trying to build up the middle here. Uh, it, it does seem like they're going to go wide receiver in the draft as a result, Ben. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you on the wide receiver take. And I think, you know, not to completely – you know, uh, you know, turn this into something where we're just promoting other work. But I do think like your you and Thomas's and Rick Spielman's discussion last night on the on the on the Sirius XM show that Sumer Sports does, like it kind of got into the fact that there's just not a ton of guys that are 350 pounds and can move relatively quickly, right? And so there is a lack of players, especially up the middle, that can really help teams. And I think in some ways, like you said, the opportunity cost of taking that type of player at eight. That definitely happens, but the fact that the pool of players that can even serve those sort of purposes from an NFL perspective drives up that price. And I think your take with PFF in 2020 has very much come to fruition, right? I think that was kind of the point in time where we were still evaluating, you know, the impact of run versus pass, run defense versus pass rush versus coverage and all these other things. And in some ways, even though rushing the football, we understood wasn't that valuable, there was this weird gap in our knowledge and understanding before you wrote the Derek Brown article that, that I think in a lot of ways has kind of shaped the direction of where, you know, NFL defenses have kind of taken. And if you don't have that guy up the middle, like you are going to struggle on early downs to be ahead of the change from a, from a defensive standpoint. And if you can't get third and crucial stops and you are playing a team that is going to be aggressive on fourth downs, like, you're you're gonna have really difficult times getting off the field without some, without touchdowns happening. So I don't mind the play even with the direction of the Carolina Panthers roster and the fact that it does seem like they are still multiple years away. But I think longer term, like you know what they do, uh, what they do in the draft this year, and obviously absolutely having to hit on some late round value in order to kind of restock the shelves uh, is very much the direction I think the Panthers absolutely have to take this offseason. Or you know the Derek Brown contract just isn't going to be enough to really move the needle for them in the NFC South. 
Yeah, the Brown had, you know, so the Panthers had about $3 million in space before the deal. Uh, Brown was counting 11.6 on option. So, you know, Taylor Moten has, you know, probably about $14 million that you can convert. Uh, Brown's deal probably makes his first year cap hit a little bit less. Uh, Tepper seems to be an owner that's willing to spend money on the team, obviously. Uh, and so, you know, Robert Hunt, for example, like his first year cap hit in that $25 million, 20, sorry, $20 million deal uh, is only six million. So they're very much a spend and prorate team, uh, which is different, right? Brant Tillis was the cap specialist with or the cap guru with the Chiefs. Lamar Hunt or not, Lamar son, Clark Hunt, uh, famous for not wanting to spend a lot of money. Brant Tillis's instruments in Kansas City were much different than the ones he's going to be able to use in Carolina, where he can spend uh, bonus and prorate the way that that he couldn't in Kansas City. It'll be interesting to see what Carolina does because now they'll be they'll probably free up cap space with this Brown right. extension. And uh, you know, and as the cap goes up, you know, the cap value of a dollar decreases over time. So you know, smoke them while you got them, uh, especially when you're obviously young and, and he's on a rookie contract and you've kind of committed to him uh, because you traded so many draft assets for him. Let's now because we have 14 minutes until this great slate. We'll talk about the draft. The draft odds in a second here. Let's talk about the infamous or the famous UFL because that's what the people came. I mean, to it was discuss. yeah, it was a dog under league in week one. Basically, I know the one game under league now. Yeah. We do have to be careful because we don't want to mislead the audience. Uh, Memphis was a dog to open, but was a favorite to close. So at close, we had favorites in. Birmingham and Memphis win and cover. And then we had dogs in San Antonio and Michigan win and win cover. Out. Win um, out, right, yeah. And then every single game went under. Uh, a few games went over the first half total and then just died in the second yeah. half. And that is yeah. the thing to think about. And 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 I do wonder from you know from people who know Paul, and I, I think very uh you know, I can't remember which difficult we're getting today, uh, whether it's simply difficult, thankfully difficult or very, very difficult, difficult. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm interested to uh, hear the chiming in here, but the, um, but I do think like even the AJ Smiths who I think are very good play callers in this league, um, I do think that there's a little bit of the whole like Christian Bale, hey, that was a great first drive. Now let's look at the unscripted plays, right? I do think right. that that is a little bit of what happens in this league where um, you get you get some decent offense that happens early in the game, and then down the stretch, the defenses are just better than the offenses do because the offensive minds in the league just aren't quite as good. And so, you know, that might lead people to bet fewer first half unders than they do full game unders. Um, again, indexing on one week of sample is probably unfair, but that's the only sample we got, right? But that's the, that the mechanism I, I I think is testable over the course of the season again with small sample sizes uh you don't really you don't really have the empirical basis for some of this stuff but you can you can build off of mems and angles i think here so let's start with the first game the first game is the san antonio brahmas uh yeah we have seen and, and as difficult said uh this this is now moved down and open at one and a half it got out to two and a half in some places including uh FanDuel here now I think believe Steve Fezzik gave out two uh, plus two for Memphis here, the boats uh, with Kate, with uh, Case Cookus. It's now down to one and a half again. Um, total thirty nine and a half. I think that opened north of forty. I think it's still forty and a half in some places, but now it's thirty nine and a half. Um, yeah, this is the one where I, I make the biggest discrepancy. Uh, I think the Brahmas played good defense last week. I think offensively their skill positions are uh, pretty good. Uh, relative to most in the league, probably third best in the NFL or sorry, in the UFL. Um, I think the Showboats uh, played pretty good defense last week, but they played the worst team in the league in the Houston Roughnecks. So I just don't really know uh, how much I can take from that. Cook has had like pretty much one good offensive drive uh, and they had a defensive touchdown. So I don't know really what to take from that. Cook, but we saw this last year. Uh, when they couldn't protect him, they had like the worst offensive line uh, Philadelphia did in the USFL. 
when he's not protected, it gets pear shaped like incredibly fast. Right. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And uh, I don't really have a strong lean on the total. I think that's actually come down a little bit as well. But I don't know. I thought Wade Phillips was kind of in his bag last week, to be honest with you. He had the punter basically throw out a touchdown as well in a lot of ways. So I think to me, you know, I, we're obviously going against Steve Fezzik. Apparently, he's got some sway in the UFL. Well, we're going streets, against we're going against somebody because yeah, it's, it's moving down to one oh. now. Basically, I think maybe you kind of wait till cool. I don't know how much time we have here. We've got five minutes or something, but. I don't, and that's another discussion as well. I know we haven't like fully fleshed this out either, but to me, empirically, like the points between three don't carry as much weight given the extra point rules in this particular league. Like I think like one, two, and three in general in some ways aren't 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 with aren't the same calculus basis as what it is. Also, we did get up some minus one fifteen movement here, it looks like as well. So we're getting a little bit of pushback. It'll be interesting to see where Circa closes on this particular number, uh, you know, as we move towards kickoff. But I like Brown. I like Brahmas. I like him first half. Yeah. I, I'm kind of with you if like you were gonna play something on the total, especially if they're basically just fitting the full game number to that second half spread. But you get a bump up on the spread there or on the total now as well. This is fun to watch in real time. You know, the market's yeah. shifting a point here and there. Um, but I would be looking at kind of like you said, just empirically, I do think the second half yeah. unders are the spots to be on, especially if you're able to kind of evaluate and watch the games, uh, just seeing if the teams have performed at all from an offensive standpoint uh, after their scripted play set, uh, how well the football is actually being moved. Because I do think in a lot of scenarios, like the second John, half unders. The John asked you a good question, which is, do you think the UFL will become a developmental option for offensive linemen given the struggle in college? I think I development. To, yeah. I think development for offensive line has been a problem since the new CBA. I don't know if the NFL, um, the NFL just doesn't do a job of, of, of looking forward on things. I, you know, I there are, there are great people that work for the NFL like Michael Lopez, but like I just don't know. Um, uh, but I don't. Uh, but I I just don't see the league like doing anything. Uh, proactive in that regard, but uh, it's a great, it's a great thought, Sean. I agree. Um, I, it, what's funny, Ben, is other than this game, like I'm kind of like bang on on a few of these other ones. Like if I look at Arlington, St. Louis, St. Louis is a team that should be a lot better than they are. I, one of our friends, uh, Bruce Gradkowski is the, is the, um, OC, uh, OC there. It opened four and 41, 41 and a half. Uh, it's now five. I, I said I was bang on. I'm not. I, I, I make it three and a half. Um, you know, uh, Bruce has Bruce has run good offense there, but it's been it's been a little bit slow to go at times. Um, and last week it was as well. Like they didn't score in the first half of that game a touchdown. They scored two touchdowns in this in this fourth quarter, uh, and you know still lost. I mean, they still gave up a 64 yard field goal to Michigan, who I think is you know I think is reasonable to say is one of the worst teams in the whole league. Uh, and they lost that game. Um, uh, the Arlington Renegades, uh, you know, won the the XFL last year with a losing record. They were competitive. In, they should have gone into halftime last week with the uh, Birmingham Stallions with a lead. Right. Um, and, you know, gave up a huge touchdown to Deion Kane down the sideline uh, at, to close the half, which probably tilted a lot of people who were – we're holding, we're holding some uh, money line tickets on first half and things like that, uh, and first half under. Um, I, I think that this is a little bit of an overreaction. To Arlington's first game. I think Arlington's a little bit more. Um, uh, Arlington's a little bit better than this, uh, but five is not necessarily a key number here either, though. And yeah. so you just have to be a little bit careful there. Um, I think when you look at um, the Birmingham, Michigan game, six and a half and six. Here, trending towards seven. Uh, I'm not offended at all by this. I make it 6.25. 41. You do have it at six and a half? Okay. I was one, that was one I was wondering on how quickly people would update with Michigan Michigan's performance last weekend. But, you know, obviously the juice is leaning in the direction of the Stallions. I don't know. I think it's a – if I was going to place a spot there, I feel like it would be Michigan first half more than anything else, right? Yeah. Um, Pro Football Focus had EJ Perry, the quarterback from Michigan, with five turnover-worthy passes last week. And when I watched okay. that game, I and, and admittingly, I like was in and out of that game more than any of the other ones. But when I was just like watching that game, I actually thought like, again, and this is why you need data 
And you can, you know, again, I'm saying this more to like rip on myself than anything. But when I watched that game, I actually thought he, he was good. I thought he had, he, he did some things. He ran for two touchdowns. He right. moved around a little bit. Um, he did, they had some turnovers, but I thought some of the turnovers were kind of fluky at times, but he did put the ball in harm's way uh, too much. And that in this league, the offenses aren't good enough for you to have turnovers because you're not going to come back over the top and win on offense uh, by answering because you're not good enough on offense to answer very much. And then lastly, and again, this is another one where Birmingham is can be so good offensively. I think Matt Corral is differently talented than most of the yeah. quarterbacks in the league. And Adrian Martinez, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, go Huskers, but um, – I do think oh, like nice. when this when the Birmingham Stallions are involved, I'm not gonna be as like I'm not gonna under. be as as willing to like under in a game like that, even though it is the highest one there. With Renegades Battlehawks, it's the same thing. Like I I think if if St. Louis clicks, they have great offense with great support. Um but that's but, the common goal, it seems like, or especially early on yeah, in the season. Exactly. Been the direction so like, of the you could lose that under general. by a ton, or it could be a no doubter like last week. Right, um, right. The last one, which is the interesting. The game of the week. Yeah. Last one, which is interesting, is the Houston Roughnecks. I, and I, I think I do think that this is where some actual people got like messed up here because the Roughnecks have the same name as last year's XFL Roughnecks, but they are the gamblers from last year's USFL, and they just changed names. And so they have, like, they don't – it's not – like, last year's Roughnecks had Wade Phillips on the promise yeah. now. And, like, this is legitimately the worst team of the league. Uh, they're five-point dogs against D.C. Jordan Chiamu has been in a lot of spring leagues. He's played well at times. And the D.C. defenders were really good last year uh, and were in the championship game. But Jordan Chiamu is too inconsistent, I think, Um you know, game for game to get the deference I think that he does in the markets. I make this 4.25, so it's not that playable, but it is interesting um, that he gets as much love as he does. This is the one where I think under is probably the best play uh, of all the totals. Um, so, so you know, take that for what it's worth. But Houston is, like, legitimately dreadful, I think. Right. Uh, and, and will be tough to watch all your Reed, Stinnett, Slash, uh, you know, whomever else is playing quarterback for that team. Uh, I got to look at, I got to remember the name of the guy that started last week, uh, Jared Quarantano. Uh, they're terrible. And so uh, that, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's the extent of your, your sort of, uh, uh, that's the extent of the under. your UFL, uh, uh preview for this week. But um, okay. Let's talk about the draft. We, we did see some movement, Ben. We looked pretty sharp for a little bit on our last Saturday show where we said, Stop listening to the people when it comes to the top two pick. And I got I to gotta rant for a little bit here before we go. Please. The aggregator accounts have gotten worse. And, yeah. and it starts with Pro Football Talk. Pro Football Talk just made an article about the fact that Drake May was the favorite to be second. Are we – like? Like sports books are now becoming the content creators for they are that's been I feel like it's in some ways been that way for a little while. Like they are the content creators, but people just write articles on divisional odds and everything well, else that add at least, them out, right? But at least they yeah, Sean Sean is part of Sean gets I, mean, we, I don't know if we ever had Florio to be honest. No, we no Pro Football Talk was a legitimate news source and one that I really admired for a long time. But yeah, we lost Florio a long time ago. But well, we had Florio for a while. Um, <laughs> Fine. And, I'll give uh, you that one. Okay. But, yeah, back to the draft odds and, and the ramp, basically, yeah. for the top two um, picks, basically, and what Florio did. So so he just, like – and I've always had a problem with, like, the Vikings territory people thinking that – like, the people who write for Vikings territory being, like um, – you know, thinking that they're real content creators when all they are doing is copying other, uh, copying other people's content and like presenting it as their own, right? I, I have a huge problem with that, and I have a huge problem with you know, like Mike Florio is you know, like just writing about Drake May being the favorite to be second. It's like the sports book and all the sharp betters are doing your work for you. That's bullshit. Yeah, I bullshit, right? Okay. But um, but then of course, 
Now Jaden Daniels is the favorite if you look at if you look at Fanny. it kind of so, continues to push out a little bit. I think he was like minus one twenty five when I checked earlier this week. Now he's up to minus one fifty. Yeah, and, and they've been equilibrated. So um, yeah. we're all adults here. Um, we're 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 all adults here. Uh, so we we know that Caleb Williams is going first, um, but second he uh, and and very difficult. Who is my 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 north star? My shining light? My guiding? My guiding? Uh, <laughs> My guiding star here. I uh, don't feel the feed the trolls, aka Mike Florio. Um, but uh, but yeah, so we have um, but we have Jaden Daniels uh, as the minus again, and minus one fifty is not a big favorite in the betting right. market in the draft on April sixth. But he is favored to go second. Uh, Drake May at plus one fifty. Uh, you know, so there's not actually a ton of, uh, you know, it's a big free there. You know, it's, it's not, not a huge deal there. And then you have McCarthy, Williams, Harrison. Number three overall pick. Again, not a ton of, you know, not a ton. Uh, you know, May is even money. Daniels plus 160. McCarthy plus 440. Now, I don't believe this to be true. Like, in my, like from my perspective. I don't think it should happen. I don't think it will happen. I don't think, I, I just don't think it will. If I gun to my head, I think it's Williams. I think it's May. And then I think some team trades up for Daniels. That's how I see it happening. And I think Marvin Harrison goes fourth. And I think cooler heads prevail. And JJ McCarthy is the, it goes Nine goes to somewhere 10. else. Yeah. And, and then Phoenix and, and, Nick, and he's Phoenix to me. Phoenix and Knicks go are lucky to go in mid the first to late first round. Yeah, 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 they're lucky to go in the first round. And if you bet under four and a half at a big uh, positive price, you are sweating the hell. You're sweating your balls off in that in that first round, but you win. And that that's again gun to my head. But with a with a ton of uncertainty, right? A ton of uncertainty. And 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 again, I, I could very well see it going Williams. Daniels, McCarthy, May, and Quasi Doppelmans is the biggest freaking hero in Vikings history. Like that, that could happen too. And I, and as Quasi's friend, I'd be pumped for Quasi Doppelmans if that happened. Right. Um, but if it gun to my head, I think like, I, I think the best bet here is JJ McCarthy at plus 440 because he's got the traits and we've seen it before. Like teams will buy traits that high and, you know, and that could, that could that could certainly happen. I think Sean's is big. Build the MF statue if that happens. Yeah, I agree. If the, if the Vikings get, oh, I'll say this: by hook or by crook, if the Vikings get Drake May in this draft, Quasi Adapalmensa is not is king. the best GM in Vikings history. Like it's just yeah. I, I, king I, of the I, North. Right? It's like it's it's happened. He kept the team competitive, which is exactly what ownership wanted him to do for two years, and he ended up with a quarterback. He ended up with the second best quarterback in the draft. Um, yeah. And and that should be that should be a thing. Um, I do think that JJ McCarthy, like the one that I saw move quite a bit this week, was I think at pick four for JJ McCarthy, who was all the way up to. You should click on that expansion, basically, um, for what uh, the pick number four, four is right? for JJ McCarthy. You want to look at but, four? Okay, yeah, yeah, because that was the one I thought moved pretty dramatically from. Oh, maybe not. I thought it was closer to plus two fifty now. Yeah, um, this is, that's another one where, you know, the market is telling you one thing and literally every swinging dick on, 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 you X, know, X. Uh, on X and, and ESPN <laughs> is telling you a different thing. Right. It is true. And, and to be honest with you, and we've talked about it for weeks. I know, you know, Sean as well mentioned, like his favorite bet is being the best defensive player, not named Dallas Turner. Like we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but like th there's just so much uncertainty at the defensive position, but also with respect to what people think the Arizona Cardinals are going to do at pick four, whether they do trade or take Marvin Harrison. But to me, I think I, I, I still, and I know we've talked about this every single week so far, but I think ad nauseum, like there's a very, there's a much smaller chance than what people are projecting that the Arizona Cardinals move off of the fourth pick. And if they stay at the fourth pick, I think it has to be Marvin Harrison Jr. No doubt. About I want to talk it. about as well. I think we'll go to about twelve ten before we go out and watch some UFL football. Um, the seventh pick, right? Where we're looking at the the seventh overall pick, um, Joe Alt. What do you think, Tennessee Titans? I was on Blaine and Mickey. Uh, you can't. I, it, 
Ben, we have such charmed lives. We get to go on these radio stations with people like Blaine Bishop, who played safety on yeah. the Oilers and Titans when they were in the Super Bowl. Legend. I'm sitting there, and he's asking me what I think. Like, who the fuck am I? Like, who the hell am I to tell Blaine Bishop what to think? But, you know, he's like, are they taking a tackle? I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, if Harrison and Neighbors are off the board at 5'6", which that's a big assumption, of course, um, at, at 4, 5, and 6. That's a big assumption. But if they're off the board and it's Roma Dunza playing third wide receiver to Ridley and DeAndre ah. Hopkins, or it's the best tackle prospect that the NFL has seen in a little bit of time, right? And then going into a round, and I believe the Titans have a pick. Let me make let me make sure before I say something ignorant, but I do want to make sure to double check that the Titans have um the Titans have a second round pick that's really high here. I'm just going to make sure um, before I say something dumb. Um, yeah, they have 38. So if you're at 38, um, you get a wide receiver that's like Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, uh, Keon Coleman. You're going you're gonna to have the option of like whatever guy falls out of the first round right, of that and, pick, right? And historically so. speaking, like, and these are L's that we've had to take. Like, historically speaking, you're going to get a better tackle. Historically speaking, it's a better bet to take a tackle at seven and a wide receiver at 38 than the other way around. Like that's, that's history because right. a tackle has to be kind of a, a, you can't scheme around a tackle. He's got to be kind of a complete player. Right. At a wide receiver, he can be, especially in that current situation that Tennessee has, he can be a complimentary piece to Ridley and Hopkins almost immediately and be successful right away. And even if he ends up being like a McCole Hardman type, that's not like a great pick, but it's also not a disaster. McCole Hardman wasn't a disaster for Kansas City, even though he wasn't exactly like a booming success. Um, yeah, I think the question is more for pick seven, like if it's Alter Fashanu, to be honest with you. I, right. know, I think like, you know, like Sam and Steve at PFF, I think had that discussion this week. To me, I do think Alt is clearly better, but you know, whether it's Fashanu or Alt, like I think that would be the one question mark for me. But I very much agree with you in the fact that like, even with what the Titans kind of did this off season, like I'm not necessarily in the same situation as the Houston Texans whatsoever, but I feel like they can at least think like, they're, they might be on the verge of being able to win a down AFC South as well. And they've kind of signaled that in a way with getting going out and getting the Jerry Sneed and going out and getting, you know, at least some guys that are going to contribute right away. And I think if they're looking at the seventh overall pick, you know, they got Tony Pollard as well, the Jerry Sneed basically. Kelvin Ridley kind of signifies like they they do in some ways are building up this veteran roster to win sooner rather than later. And I think if they're evaluating this draft class, like it very much does make sense to go out and call that pick seven, given what we've seen from a performance standpoint of top 10 picks at, you know, the tackle position and just how much immediate impact they can have right away and how much clearly better, like the top two guys are at the top tackle position, um, you know, just in general for this one. So I, I do agree with you. I, I think my question is basically like, is there a scenario where Fashanu could potentially be that selection instead of, yeah, Jarrell, which well, I'm not quite sure I, I know. And I think so. I do think yeah. so. I think that the way to hedge that is obviously to bet that they'll take tackle. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're not sure about Alt, uh, Talese, Fuaga, Fashano, then you just don't play in this market. You play in the what position they'll take. Um, right. And you go with, you know, a position to see Titans first pick. Um, and I'm not sure if it's available on, I don't think they list it on, the one, on one or yeah. the other. And you go ahead and you take tackle um, for them. Um, the other one, and this one does seem to have moved a little bit in the direction. Uh, but this is the this is the the Falcons pick at eight. And this also doubles as a who is the first uh, defensive player. And we'll wrap up with this. Dallas Turner, we talked about uh, edge players uh, and interior defensive linemen on the fir on the uh, Sirius XM show with Dimitrov. I know some people have asked. Thomas will do one of these shows relatively soon. Uh, but we have been swamped with some things at Sumer. So we've only done the one show a week, which has been the Sumer show. Uh, so just bear with us. But uh, Dallas Turner, Jared Verse, Quinion Mitchell, the corner from Toledo, Laitu Latu, uh, and Roma Dunze was an offensive player, and then Terry on Arnold, the corner from Alabama. That looks like, um, uh, yeah, this is interesting. So Sam just wants to rate weight run blocking at zero. 
that 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 could be you know and, and maybe i have some influence on that uh maybe i have to pay for my sins a little bit um <laughs> but yeah like so this this particular one oh by the way there are scouts and i i have seen you know we 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 have talked to some people there are scouts that do think that that alt is not the best tackle in this class and right. I don't agree with it. I actually read like a really good blog post by Seth Byrne, who is, uh, I think, uh, I think his blog is phenomenal actually. And uh, his, yeah, uh, he has alt first, but um, yeah, the, most of the people, most of the people have alt first, but it's not everybody. And it's interesting. Um, and I do know that there are people that don't have alt first. So just because you think the tight, just because they may go uh, with, with a, um, they may go with a tackle. It doesn't mean it has to be alt. Okay. So with, with this, with the Falcons, this is one where this could be as simple as don't overthink it. Dallas Turner like is considered, I believe by most to be a uh, head and shoulders above what you're seeing with, uh, with, your, with verse and lie to um, Mitchell and, and Arnold could be somebody where they go to uh, with corner to, to go opposite AJ Terrell. Uh, so that's certainly a possibility. Adunza, I think is a possibility as well, although they, sh they short up and they've gone skill position the last three drafts. Right. So I don't know if they, they go with that. Um, but if you think that they're going to take edge, which they do need a pure pass rusher on that team, uh, I think Turner is the, is the play here. And then the question is, is you just have to price it out and say how, what, what you think that percentage is before you go ahead and make that play. Yeah, I don't, I definitely don't mind Dallas Turner at this price. Basically. I think there might be a, a, like I think my second favorite option is really Quinny on Mitchell, like you mentioned, basically opposite AJ Terrell. They obviously have Jesse Bates in the back end as well. Like I do think that kind of rounds out a pretty strong secondary unit for the Atlanta Falcons. And then you're just kind of situationally rotating pass rushers for this year and trying to land that guy next year. So I could see a case for that. I do think Mitchell is far and away the best cornerback. Um, in this draft class and could see, you know, because of that and the lack of play, the, the lack of play behind him, I think in some ways that could push him to be a top 10 pick. So I don't mind it. I would not be surprised as well if the Falcons move off of this pick um, and, and kind of move down in the draft and maybe stockpile some other picks later on in the first round and, and kind of get like the third or fourth best option at the edge rush position. But um, I, I think right now that would be, my one concern because like you said if if the jj mccarthy hype isn't real i do think one of these quarterback needy teams that are sitting like 11 12 13 or 14 are going to get impatient around pick seven pick eight and kind of want to go up and get jj mccarthy if they do if they are actually in love with him as much as what people are projecting right now so that would be the one concern betting into the number eight overall pick market uh but if it is the falcons I actually lean maybe more towards cornerback being an option than what the current betting market projects right now. Big decision here in Memphis as to whether or not they're going to call this uncatchable. Oh, no. Uh, I don't even have it up yet. They're going to call pass interference. The Memphis, uh, the showboats uh, of Steve, Bezik, early? Steve Bezik's money are moving the football on the Brahmas here, which is good for the over, good for our friend Cleve TA, one of our favorites, uh, who liked the over in this game. Uh, good for Stormy Bonatoni, one of our favorite broadcasters, also who has the over in this game. Uh, for those who like the Brahmas, though, a little bit of a little bit of early tension here, um, uh, a little bit of tension. The fact of the matter is, before we close this broadcast out, the Falcons should take a quarterback because Kirk right. Cousins has a two-year deal and he's 36 years old and he's coming off of an Achilles and he's not the long-term answer at that position. He's going to get them to eight wins, hopefully, for the first time since Thomas was their GM. But they should take a quarterback, and and if that means trading down and getting Phoenix or Knicks, that's great. If not, they should take it. They should take JJ McCarthy if he falls to them, because yeah. if they don't get quarterback right, it doesn't matter if they can't rush the passer to an extent, uh, as we found out last year with with Desmond Ritter. Um, this has been a lot of fun, Ben. I can't wait to uh, commiserate with you uh, over UFL today, uh, the NCAA tournament tonight. Uh, the women's NCAA tournament tomorrow. Our page, our page buckets, man. What is up? I, well, that? look, Paige, look, the gods. Like that was, you know, an incredible cover by by Paige Beckers down what nine with, uh, with just a few minutes ago, going ahead and covering that two and a half by the grace of God. But 
Uh, but it was a, a sad loss for our Minnesota. Look, Minnesota can't win anything. Uh, we all know right. that. Uh, we don't. We don't. Hopefully, Sorry, she, Sean. hopefully she finds somewhere else to go. Although the Lynx have won a bunch in the W. Hopefully she can find a place and go and win in the WNBA where everybody can see uh, her brilliance. But uh, this has been a great time. We got to see Ben's brilliance here. For Ben Brown, this has been Eric Eager. This has been, and, and producer Matt Stotsky, this has been the Sumer Sports Show.